Hello everybody. My name is Sarah Backley and I'm the Associate Director at the British Chamber of Commerce in Japan. Welcome today to an event that I know that many of you, myself included, have been looking forward to over the last couple of weeks, entitled Changes, Challenges and Opportunities in Education. As the title suggests, we'll be looking at how the education sector in Japan has been dealing with the impact of COVID-19, details of how they've made the shift to online teaching and training, the unprecedented challenges that have come with this process, and also looking at the positives and the opportunities for further change that have come from it. We'll be hearing about the immediate as well as the long-term impact of COVID-19 and the effect it's likely to have on the future of education altogether. To do this, we'll be welcoming Kirsten O'Connor, founder and director of Quest Tokyo and former head teacher of the British School of Tokyo Primary School, who will also be moderating the session. We will have Matt Knowles, British British Council Director for Japan, whose career at the British Council has taken him all over the world and has recently moved from Shanghai, where he served as the British Council East China Director for four years. Our second representative from the British Council is Robin Skipsey, who serves as Academic Manager and he works mainly on teaching training for local Japanese teachers in English. His team is currently working with Claire, the Council local authorities, to pilot and launch a new online course for ALT's assistant language teachers on the JET program. We also have Nora Yamada, Director of External Relations at the British School of Tokyo on the panel today, who is very passionate about the topic as an experienced educator in both Japan and the UK and a mother of three children. And lastly, but certainly not least, we'll be joined by Richard Strawn, Corporate Business Development Manager at Rosetta Stone Learning Centre, who has dedicated the last 28 years giving business English language treatment training and coaching, and he'll be bringing a different viewpoint to a B2B business training to the discussion today. Um, just before I get started, I wanted to quickly mention a couple of the other events we have coming up at the Chamber. Next Thursday, we have our first ever digital general meeting. This will be a chance for us to reflect over the past Chamber year and for you to meet the new Executive Committee. Um, the following Tuesday, the 9th of June, we have an event titled Is COVID an Economic Disaster for Japan? where we will hear views from Tak Okubo, North Asia Director of the Economist Corporate Network, and Naomi Davies, Economic Counselor at the British Embassy in Tokyo. Um, lastly, the following week, we will be holding our first online SME roundtable, where we welcome up to 25 SME members or non-members to join our open forum to network and share and learn from fellow peers. Details of all of these will, de will be displayed on your screen after today's session. I'll stop rambling on now. And um, many of you listening today will be educators, parents or students yourselves. So please do tune in until the end where we'll have our experts on the panel offering advice and hopefully have time to answer any questions you may have for them. So without further ado, I'll pass on to Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here hosting today's webinar alongside my fellow, fellow panelists, Nora, Matt, Robin and Richard. We are looking forward to discussing some of the educational changes and challenges that have been created over the last few months. Uh, also thinking about those opportunities that may be emerging. Um, we're very pleased so many of you have joined us today. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Uh, please do feel free to send us through a question. And as we talk, we'll try to incorporate as many of those as we can into our conversation. So, so team, let's dive straight in uh, and talk about the now ever present topic of online learning. Richard, let's start off with you. Can you outline perhaps some of the changes to the logistics and models of training that have occurred through the switch for your company? Yeah, I mean, first of all, th thank you very much for, for hosting this. Um, from the B2B um, point of view, I think we've probably had less issues than perhaps uh, on the academic side, because obviously our corporate clients are pretty well versed in, in terms of using video conferencing equipment, etc. So actually, for my business, 100% has, has just shifted online. Um, Obviously, there's a few challenges, for example, technical challenges, home environment as well, which is not always conducive to, you know, to, to communicative training. Um, and then just a, a final point, which I think is a, a big challenge, is actual physical lack of contact. 
because I think a lot of communication happens informally. So, you know, we miss that in the, in the office environment. And I think what, what I'm interested in also from kids' point of view and what the other panelists have to say is, you know, are they struggling with a lack of contact with, with their classmates, et cetera? So I think these, these are the, the kind of main challenges that I've found. I think that that's a really pertinent point and we'll absolutely go deeper into that as we as we work our way down. Robin, have you seen uh, something similar or have you found other challenges in, in your line? Robin? Uh, thank you, Kirsten. I think, um, I think that uh, so the, the kind of focus of the, the work we're doing is often with uh, um, Japanese schools and lo local schools basically and and, um, and the um, the issues that uh, the issues there are more about access to, to online learning whether or not uh, students are able to uh, access lessons whether um, the schools are able to provide the support that they need and so I think um, that's probably the big discussion with it, uh, when it comes to local schools here in Japan uh, but obviously, um, as from the children's point of view, I think that this long period of not being in school, of not um, being with other, um, with their friends, uh, has uh, takes a big toll on them. Mm. Have there been um, sort of approaches taken by uh, the Japanese schools that you've seen that have varied, or are, is there a sort of a, a united effort to to bring some kind of online opportunity? From what I've I've seen, I've I've seen a, a range of some schools really offering uh, a, a deep and um, quite, I mean, in fact, heavy burden on on a lot of their children. But other schools in in the Japanese sector perhaps not offering much at all, perhaps due to lack of uh, um, materials and equipment but also training of staff have you experienced that yeah so I think we've been uh, we've been surveying um, uh, the response of different schools across the country um, uh, there's uh, the Ministry of Education kind of published uh, statistics on this and also we've conducted um, a, a British Council survey with with teachers in Japan and it's absolutely what you described there's a there's a, a very varied response but I think that um, uh, generally speaking, schools have not, in the public sector, have not gone very much online. Uh, there has been an attempt to support students through, for example, um, pointing them in the direction of already existing online resources, such as the NHK programmes. Um, boards of education have posted worksheets, for example, online. And there's been some attempt to record some, uh, to record videos um, uh, by, in, in some cases. But I think according to the Minister of Education statistics, only around 5% of um, schools have provided any live video um, lessons, for example. And there are good reasons for that, uh, a lot of them to do with um, whether or not, you know, the number of students that will be able to access those lessons, were, even were they made to be made available. And as you say, also the, um, the computer literacy, the digital literacy of, uh, of teachers and Japan actually, amongst the advanced uh, nations, has one of the, um, when, when teachers are asked about what kind of teacher training they need, uh, in Japan, the highest response of teachers is that they, uh, they require training in using digital tools. Mm. Uh, you, you'll find, for example, in the UK or in China, um, that's rated as a much lower priority by teachers. They feel more comfortable with that. But in Japan, it's a very strong need. It seems like an area that um, maybe at the moment is proving to be a, a a, a challenge but is certainly going to provide an opportunity uh, and may give a, a real sort of impetus towards that development and it's interesting to hear as well two of the examples that you give there about uh, schools using videos and worksheets these are two examples of myriad uh, strategies that schools are using if I jump to Nora you mm. are you know absolutely at the chalk face as we say uh, what have been the biggest changes that you've uh, experienced in the last uh, two months, but also what, what have you found that's been effective for you? Well, I think there are actually, you know, tremendous benefits here. You know, we've all heard the phrase, you know, never waste a good crisis. And I think that a lot of our um, teachers and certainly myself have found that um, we, we set up the online learning um, using technologies like Pear Deck and Padlet and Google Classroom. Um, which meant that we were able to sort of elicit from students in the lesson in real time short little chunks of writing short little you know generative tasks where they had to sum up or evaluate or synthesize knowledge and because although we were very lucky in that all our students um, had laptops and we, we made sure in the first few days that any students who didn't were able to loan laptops from the school so we had that as an equalizer 
However, we have children with, you know, two or three children at home and mum and dad working. So children are not always able to verbally contribute. Now, this, I think, has proven to be like fantastic because teachers often fall into the trap of accepting what we call proxies for learning. So you've got a table of students who look really busy. Um, you know, you've got kids in the class at the front. They've all got their hands up and they seem to be working. But, you know, there are always children in every classroom who say nothing, who never put their hand up. And as we, we research tells us that students go from room to room to room every day without being you know, challenged by any teacher. So the great thing for me about Zoom and you know, incorporating things like Pear Deck is you know, have a simple question at the beginning of the lesson to make sure that, uh, you know, to find out if we're on an equal base on this particular topic, whatever it might be, Macbeth or, or you know, um, thermodynamics. And so I, there is no sort of proxy for learning. I haven't got these keen, keen children with their hands up. You know, I can get little, little, um, little chunks of, of um, little samples from each student in the classroom in a democratic way. You know, personalities or other, you know, social experience is really, really important. But what I've found is that if teachers are able to continue to give prompt, precise, frequent, short little bits of feedback, you want less essays and more paragraphs, then that momentum, that power of the teacher's relationship with the child is actually sustained. That's really, really interesting. And I think uh, we talked a little bit a while ago about the impact on some students who are perhaps more introverted or more extroverted. This kind of system where it really does equalize the opportunity because you, you, there's, a, there's a tube through which they're offering their feedback and there's no uh, perhaps judgment by others or no anxiety about that. So in some ways, this works extremely well for some students and let's not let's not sort of uh, get ahead of ourselves there are definitely drawbacks to all of yes, this yes, we'll come yes. to those but certainly that's a window richard do you think that's something that you might find with training as well because you know we all know when we've been to um teach training sorry to say to all the people who've teacher trained me in the past uh, there have been sections of training where you perhaps switch off or aren't quite as fully involved do you think this might be a an opportunity that could be harnessed with the your training you're muted richard yep okay sorry um yes i i, I think there's, there's a certain you know a kind of lack of um inhibition can come from online um you're talking about people kind of hiding in the classroom Sometimes what we find is that there's a, in, you know, inside the company, there's a hierarchy and if the boss is there, people don't want to speak out so much. And I think actually the using online platform reduces this a little bit. So to some extent, I would say that's true, yeah. Mm, I think it's a, it's a really great opportunity and Nora, thanks for highlighting that. It would be remiss of me to be talking about education and the challenges that we're pressing, that we're facing at the moment, not to mention exams. And the, uh, well, frankly, debacle of the uh, year 13 and year 11 situation this year. Nora, just sort of briefly, what, um, where, have been the, where have been the biggest anxieties there? But also, do you see any opportunities there for development in this sort of the current exam systems? Well, I mean, I read this morning in the FT, uh, there was an interesting article by Kenneth Baker, and he was talking about the fact that, you know, the, these exams come from the 1950s. This, this system comes from the 1950s when 93% of students needed a checkout card at 16. And, you know, education obviously goes to, goes to 18 in the UK. Um, and, you know, many, many teachers have felt for a long time that the GCSEs, because they need to be a general certificate of secondary education, actually put a sort of a ceiling on the very brightest children. And so I think there is something to be said for um, for looking at, you know, the amount of anxiety that they, that they produce. Um, a huge amount of time goes into exam technique and, um, you know, preparing to maximize scores in a particular sort of, um, uh, you know, examination. And actually, you know, could we be teaching in that time? Could we be could could the students be learning more? Um, and so I think we'll see how the centre assessed grades go this year. And it may be that um, that you know there there are questions in the future about how best teachers and students' time is used. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly I think that that, that uh, there will be questions about the 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 um, the emphasis and the time that is spent on preparing for these examinations in the yeah. future. I don't think we can overestimate the amount of time that is taken, and we all, we've all heard it. We need you need to learn this for the exam and learning something for an exam rather than learning how to think around or within a subject. 
Um, and so I, I, I quite strongly think that there's an opportunity here because it's been something that we've been talking about for the last 25 years to absolutely no, with no yeah. impact. So uh, perhaps there's some momentum with a forced situation like we've got right now where exam results will be established in a different way uh, yeah. to see whether or not that, that can be really powerful and, and impactful. Matt, you obviously have perhaps a, a view of the more global challenges uh, that schools are facing. Have you, have you been able to see any patterns across or what the biggest challenges for schools and also universities have been? Yeah, a few points from comments that have already been made. I think um, there's, there's, there's often excitement that new digital platforms um, level the playing field and in, ensure that um, a much wider range of people have access to quality material or are able to engage with an outstanding teacher. I think it's important to acknowledge also that uh, in the digital space, um, there's often real inequality in terms of globally the access that people have to a high speed internet connection or the IT that's available. So I think we, we kind of temper some of the excitement about new digital technology with a sense of the real inequality uh, around access. Also, I think there can be a trend, uh, you're talking about how to teach people to think. There can be a trend even with new technology to uh, fall back on more traditional linear um, teaching practices. So uh, whilst uh, Google Classroom or, or Padlet or other highly dynamic interfaces can nurture a more discursive, highly tailored um, learning experience in, in the hands of a teacher that is imagining that some of these new tools are, uh, are like a traditional classroom setup, you can still end up with a very uh, mm -hmm. near traditional model. So I think that there's a lot of diverse practice around the world. Uh, there's very variable IT infrastructure and there will be a huge amount of evaluation going on, um, particularly, I think, here in Japan, to reflect on the, the last few months. Mm, I think uh, you hit on a really interesting point there. It's the variation in uh, practice that uh, we can even hear just even amongst our initial conversation here. And, and to be, in, in some ways, it's to be expected uh, when you consider that schools and universities and, and uh, training facilities really did switch which overnight and I think any of us who've been in education for any length of time know that we have been talking about how can we harness technology in education effectively we've been talking about this well since the internet came in so it, this is not something new but what it has done in, it, it seems to me is it's given at least some momentum and some purpose towards having to do it because suddenly teachers worldwide in all sectors have had to find ways to effectively uh, engage learning and yeah. that's not an easy thing it's not an easy thing to do in a classroom and when you train to be a teacher you you develop your skill set as a trainer as a teacher you develop that skill set and you you know you never stop learning but teachers now uh, and trainers now are having to re-establish their toolkit you're having to re-equip your toolkit very very quickly so um in some ways i suspect that as you say the equity issues which we'll come to a bit more in a minute will will um hold some systems back for longer but there are opportunities for um for it to move forward but it, it is certainly interesting um richard you mentioned the psychological impact on students and i do think that that's a, a really important area to consider how you we can't deny that there are opportunities to uh, online learning but we also must acknowledge the the difficulties that it presents particularly i think for younger students uh, for anybody who's got a child below the age of i would suggest 11 or 12 this is challenging for children in international schools they may very well be familiar with the technology and have good technical skills as such but to be an independent learner bereft of your support network let alone your teacher um, it's challenging and I, and I think that we will have to mitigate against some of the impacts of being outside of outside of school and university do you uh, I mean some of you are parents are you seeing some of that those behaviors in your children some some of that anxiety coming through your children Richard perhaps yeah I mean my my kid is uh, seven years old <clears throat> and uh, he's he's an only child, so he doesn't even have the, the siblings in his support. 
as well. Um, to be to be fair to him, he's he's pretty self sufficient. Um, but I'm just wondering, like below the surface, you know, on a, on a daily basis, things seem to be going okay. He does his his home study and what have you. He has regular contact with the, with the school. Um, but you know, as we're going on week by week, you know, after one week or two weeks, nah, it's okay. And now you're getting into six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, and I do I do worry about this. Actually, I'm interested to know, for, you know, for, for the other panelists as well. Yeah. I agree, and I, I think it's it, this is not something we'll see behaviours manifesting themselves now, but it's the longer term manifestation mm. we need to be concerned of. Matt, have your children been uh, affected by this? Yeah, I think it's interesting the adjustment that we've all been able to make. I think back to week one, which might have, might have been twelve or thirteen weeks ago. Now there were a lot more arguments in the household. Um, I think it's been interesting to to observe how we have been able to adjust. Um, I think we, we often fall back on quite an, a narrow definition of, of intelligence. Um, and it, it can be your, your, your exam score rather than uh, wider, wider measures of your well-being or your, 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 your social skills and your creative, your, 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 your physical um, exercise abilities. So, I think hanging hanging on to a wider definition of the the kind of young people we're hope, hoping to to nurture is really important in all of this. Yeah, I agree. And Nora, I don't know if you have children, Robin. Uh, Nora, <laughs> I would just like to add. I think you know I read a really interesting article on EduSurge website. And it was just saying that you know I suppose it's good news and bad news, but um, research has shown that this sort of online learning scenario simply requires, so, you know, children have that input from teachers and parents and the social um, input, which is, you know, the, the cocktail that makes up for a great school experience. And, you know, sort of, um, it was with a certain amount of, uh, of, I don't know, resignation that I read that, you know, parents do simply have to put in more in an online learning situation. Students need to feel, just as I was saying, you know, those short prompt bits of feedback, you're doing well, I can help you make progress here. They need that more from parents as well. You know, parents need to show a daily interest in what students are doing. Um, and the third part of that puzzle is uh, providing opportunities for social interaction for students. You know, you know, students teach each other a lot. And so in the Zoom context, it's really important to use functions like breakout room where they can talk to each other, they can teach each other in a less high stakes context of perhaps in front of the whole classroom. Um, and so at BST, one of the things that we're really focused on is that even though it may not be possible for us to bring all students back uh, in the very near future, um, we realize that, that ensuring that students remain part of a learning community, that they have social opportunities with their peers, is part of what creates that momentum for learning and um, wanting to, to engage with that learning community. So I think we all have to put in a little bit more. Um, however, None of us are commuting. Um, you know, a lot of meetings have been scraped off the calendar. And so that extra time for teachers and parents um, does need to go into um, making sure that students know that we're there and we're supporting them and we're really interested in them making progress. Mm, I think that that's a, a really good point. And uh, one of the, uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing the same kind of uh, feedback from clients actually through my work that at the beginning, it was quite stressful trying to find routine and trying to find your place in the house uh, and also yeah. trying to find your identity in casual clothes. Um, am I work mum or am I home mum? Kids can't tell the difference. So I think that took a very long time to settle. But I think we are, it, it's, it's going to be absolutely obvious that there will be anxiety in children as the, as the last weeks have gone on missing their peers, but also now there's going to be a new wave of that anxiety as we start to reintegrate into school. And if we think about the messages that school children have absorbed over the last few months, the panic amongst adults for a start and the, the, the gravity of this situation, there will undoubtedly be anxiety about safety. And I think that that's the same for teachers. There will be anxiety about teacher safety for themselves but also keeping their, their, their children uh, healthy but also meeting the milestones knowing that we've had some uh, difference in approach for the last few months how are we going to meet those milestones but also I feel like for, for any of us uh, as, as adults in Tokyo 
trainers or teachers or office workers, um, the commute. I think that that is going to be something that, that there's a huge anxiety from people on. And so when we think about how can we support and mitigate against those kinds of um, psychological impacts, I think that there are some, some key areas that we almost just as humans need to be aware of with each other. And, and just sort of to list a few, just the things like kindness and being empathetic to other people's perception and understanding of the situation because we're all dealing with it differently and we're all dealing with it publicly and privately so having that that those elements right the way through all of our systems um, and also how we manage that pace of return i think um nora you're right for 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 children the um being able to be together is almost as important as the education that they get in school i've always said that children i mean the purpose of school of course is an education but you also learn to be a person in the world because it's a microcosm of a world so then at the moment that's been interrupted and it's crucial that we can resume that as soon as it it becomes safe whilst maintaining a sense of reality um of this situation because although it feels a little like there's a light at the end of the tunnel at the moment with the um, a, um, state of emergency being lifted we still need to be quite realistic um let's then talk at nora you've explained some of the the opportunities that you've seen robin have you seen any uh, opportunities presenting themselves to you in your work with the japanese schools where do you feel there might be some momentum that you can build on going forward uh well i think that the um Clearly that what's going to happen as a result of the, you know, the very varied response to this crisis is that probably in, in the years to come, there's going to be quite a lot of investment in, um, in technology for schools. And, and we can expect to see probably a far more schools where, you know, students will have tablets, for example, where there'll be a learning management system so that, so that the response can be, a, you know, so that the schools can be better prepared if there's a, if a similar kind of emergency in the, in the future. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things um, that's very clear about uh, online learning is that um, you, you mentioned how quickly it's had to happen. But actually online learning, online teaching um, is more difficult than face-to-face uh, -face teaching, I would say. And so it shines, uh, it shines a very harsh light on both the, the teaching materials and the, and the delivery of, of teaching. And so actually, if we're going to move to more online uh, uh, teaching in the future, uh, then um, that requires a big investment of time and, and development in, in teachers to, you know, to really make sure that they're, they're ready to respond to it. Um, you know, the clarity of instructions, the clarity of explanations, all of these kind of things are, are much more important uh, on, I mean, they're important face to face, but they're even more important online because you can't see whether or not students are looking puzzled um, or, or, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. And I would say that, uh, as as you mentioned at the start, so as was mentioned at the start, we're working we're working on a, um, an online teacher training course for new Jet ALTs. That's not an easy thing to put together, but we we took a needs analysis of that at the end of 2018. We've been working on the course for about a year, and we're we're getting ready for it to be launched this year. It takes time to design good quality uh, resources uh, to make sure to user test them to make sure that uh, they're clear. And that, uh, that that everything is uh, is easy uh, easy for the user to to understand, and so you know throwing together a course in a couple of days is never ever going to to, to reach those le levels of quality. So I think there's going to be a lot of work in the coming uh, coming months and years in order to to produce better quality online resources for teachers and, and students across Japan. I think you're right, and and that's going to take a lot of money, a lot, and as you say, a lot of time. But it's also it's going to need um, mobilising in both directions. It will need absolute buy-in from leadership and also governments. When you're thinking about systemically across Japanese schools, it's going to need government buy-in here and next buy-in. Uh, but it also needs the mobilisation of the people who are going to deliver that. So in some ways, perhaps this has been an opportunity to to yeah. to, to connect those, Nora. I just wanted to add, you know, I think that it's not, it, it will take investment, but Japan has never been shy of investing in things. Um, but I think if you think about Japan, I mean, our head teacher in secondary said to me last Friday, no more snow days or typhoon days or influenza class closures. You know, these are all common um, disruptions to education in Japan. And so I think uh, we can be quite persuasive in, in um, securing this funding because it's, um, I, I'd say on average, um, three or four days are lost in, in public schools in Tokyo. You know, as, as uh, Tokyo residents will know, if influenza infection reaches above a, a certain number in a class, the whole class will be closed and the class is shut until, you know, specified a week or more. 
And we've all experienced snow days, typhoon days, these kinds of dangers are quite frequent in, in Japan. So I think there's a clear, um, you know, those days when, when head teachers and, and local education authorities have to really, um, you know, make tough decisions about whether to close a school are, are potentially gone because we can just add, you know, with agility and, and alacrity, just shift online and kids stay at home safe. And when we can be confident that the education is continuing and just just one more point I'd like to make, I think as a, as a secondary school teacher in the UK, and I know it's the same in the US and across the world, particular shortage subjects like physics, for example, it's extremely difficult to recruit physics uh, teachers. Um, and, you know, there are there are teachers, there are schools in the UK with uh, with a level being taught without specialist physics teachers. Um, so I think you know, this is an opportunity for schools to share great teachers and for, for teachers to reach out, um, you know, through online learning. So, you know, I, I know I sound, uh, you know, um, unremittingly positive, but I can just see so many opportunities. Uh, so it's yeah. the, it's the way to, it's the way to be, we've, we've got to be positive <laughs> in the situation. I'm going to just um, jump into a question that we've had come through from Darren McNeil uh, from Tokyo Global Gateway. He's got two questions. Number one, how do we guarantee privacy? i.e. screenshots of students and sharing that has been has that been something that's been considered in the work that you're doing Richard are you thinking about that or yeah well obviously we you know we have um, issues with confidentiality etc um so basically the, the the simple answer is I think it's very very difficult to have a hundred percent um guarantee of privacy so obviously we we have um you know agreements with all our, our clients um and but it's it's interesting with the platforms because obviously you know zoom is, has become very very popular but zoom's had some confidentiality issues so different clients are using different platforms and it can get a little bit messy um so i think obviously companies are are, are very much aware of this um, um but i think you know there's there's no fail safe system in in the world and it's just a risk that we have to accept yeah, I agree. And Nora, has that, I mean, that's something that's always high, high priority in schools in terms of safeguarding. Has that been something that's been considered? Absolutely. Well, I mean, very early on, we realised that we, we needed to, to move up a level of security. So, you know, initially, um, students were in Zoom meetings and teachers were very carefully checking. Of course, you know, the, the meeting uh, controller has to admit the, the students. But then we moved into a password protected um, system very quickly. And, um, you know, we're very lucky at the British School, we have a, Ian Crummy is dedicated um, online learning sort of leader. So we invested in that a few years ago and it's, it's paid out of dividends because we had an expert in-house who was able to point out all these potential shortfalls. Um, yeah, thank goodness. Gosh, that was perhaps uh, some, some foresight. Uh, second question from Darren while we're on this. Have we, has anybody started trying to use AR or VR in the classroom yet? And if so, what is working? I think I know the answer to this question. <laughs> Robin, anybody in your classrooms using that? Uh, no. No. <laughs> Richard? No. Nora yet? Even for me. Even for too you. Far. Matt, have you had any experience of that being integrated into education systems yet? No. No. <laughs> Not yet, yeah. I think, uh, Darren, I think it's on its way, but it hasn't quite reached yet and probably isn't at the, the top of the list of priorities for everybody at the moment. But thank you very much for your question. Okay, let's break, I would just, just say that actually uh, that is, uh, virtual reality is something that I think some of the online language learning apps are looking at introducing because uh, obviously, potentially for language learning, it has some quite useful applications. Uh, but yeah. it's very much at the uh, aspirational stage, I think. Yeah, that we might need another crisis to bring that to, to fruition, perhaps. Um, OK, let's move on a little bit then to um, some of the talk about cross-border education and uh, the impact that COVID-19 is going to have on that. Matt, have you got any insight into what impact this will have on the school the, and the associated school restrictions will have on Japan hosting students or sending students overseas and mm -hmm. whether there's going to be some global impact on international studies and universities? Yeah, a, a few a few initial reflections. I think um, with quarantine arrangements in place on so many borders and travel restrictions, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly around timing. Yeah. Um, another consideration is the the hit that the airline industry has taken and the the changing cost structure potentially that will come with international travel. I think many forecast it will be much more expensive. 
uh, in the future. We've, we've done some surveys across East Asia to look at the, the appetite for international higher education, and that's very much still there. Um, it's been interesting in the last few weeks to see a number of UK universities announced that they'll be going online. Um, the University of Cambridge made uh, an announcement that caught the headlines last week. I think Manchester a few days have signaled that they'll do their first semester online too. Um, it's, it's not necessarily what students want. Mm. Um, I think people still hang on to the idea of an on-campus experience for many of the reasons that Nora was referencing the the university experience is so much more than the the time you have in a lecture theatre so whilst you might buy the idea of an online course uh, you might be hesitant about the idea of an online degree program for all that we learn through um, the, the the social interaction we have with with other people the, the the immersive experience we have of living and studying in a different place I think there's um I would say there's real concern around the, the funding model for, for so many different institutions, universities, cultural institutions, all having to look again at uh, the, the way that they will ensure financial sustainability. There's an interesting question about transnational education and the role that partnerships will play or where an institution has campus in another part of the world. How that will how that will be utilised. I think coming back to Manchester, they they have an MBA program, and um, the the course is largely online. But they have six centres mm. from regions of the world where you can go for um, the, the the more immersive um, modules. So that there'll be more there'll be more um, experimentation. There'll be more more diverse models that people. Um, Pilot. I can I can see we've got Alison Beale uh, on on the call, and I think fundamentally there isn't that there isn't a concern about the 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 long term sustainability of these institutions. We know the value of of our universities in tackling all of the problems that we that we face, um, but the the future funding model and the the timing of on campus experiences feel like they're very up for grabs at the moment. Yeah, I think that, that that funding issue is going to be enormous because the overseas student uh, brings a, a price value on their head. And so if there's less of that travel, Nora, you wanted to add something. I just wanted to add, yeah, I mean, the uh, I think it was the BBC or The Guardian actually jumped the gun slightly with that. And um, perhaps people who aren't familiar with the British uh, higher education model. So Cambridge did say that, that uh, lectures would move online, but they're intending they had to sort of backtrack and, and, and try and get the message out because we have students at, at BST, for example, that are going to be heading to Cambridge in, uh, in September. And so they're still intending to keep seminars and tutorials online. And perhaps interestingly, because of the, the model of many UK universities like Durham, Oxford or Cambridge that have these college models, it might be, be possible to keep students once they've gone through quarantine, they've arrived in the UK and they're, they're learning in their colleges. So they can use these large lecture spaces to have spaced out seminars and, and you know, the, the, the very famous, you know, the, the Oxford tutorial or the, or the, the Cambridge uh, supervision where students are learning one to one or one to two. Um, as academics that I know at Cambridge and Oxford at the moment are absolutely intending to continue those, absolutely intending to welcome students to halls um, and colleges. So I think that's something that's quite different from the US model where more teaching is done uh, on a larger scale. So it may be something that um, draws more students to the UK. Um, in, in the coming years because there is this you know smaller we can all see the risks of having 100 students in, in a lecture hall um, and so I think probably it's right that Manchester and, and Cambridge have decided that that type of learning will shift online mm. um, but yeah. lots of changes in that sector that's for sure for sure I was reading that uh, in the University World News that there is there is an expectation that it will take five there'll be a five-year recovery period mm. that's right and I think China if you look at China's experience of SARS yeah. Um, it was five years for the, the international student numbers from China to to recover. I think in this uh, in this crisis, the the employment prospects for for that next generation will take a lot longer to recover. 
certainly recovery will be far slower than the decline. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's um, there's also a fair bit of research now about uh, Asia and how students may well choose to do intra regional study rather than going beyond the shores of Asia. Have you have you seen any sort of indicators of that yet, or where do you see the impacts of that falling? I think. Um, go ahead. Well, no, just to this this idea that there are so many partnerships. I mean, coming coming from China, most recently. Um, the, the number of institutional links that UK universities have with, with Chinese universities and in many cases to have a physical footprint in China allows a very different range of transnational education experiences. Uh, it be interesting to see how those models develop. It absolutely will and there was one suggestion that actually there's an opportunity for Japan here because the low cost of higher education here may be appealing regionally. Uh, it's unusual to see the cost of higher education to be as low as it is in Japan in many instances. So perhaps there's, there's an opportunity there that Japan can, can harness unexpectedly. And I think the way that Japan has dealt with, uh, you know, COVID-19, which, you know, by many measures is very, very successful. I think parents perhaps feeling anxiety about sending their children to, you know, the really big markets, the UK and the US, um, you know, they might, they might feel safer, um, more reassured considering somewhere like Japan. Mm. I think it's, um, it's I, I've been talking to parents recently and I think there, there may well be an anxiety over the next few years about even you know, boarding schools and going to international schools and taking up those opportunities where the control of the community is, is, uh, is different. Um, there may well be a long, much longer term impact than we can predict yet. So, uh, in very interesting times. I think it is clear that there are challenges, but uh, but also opportunities there. Okay, let's. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Let's move on to um, thinking about perhaps some advice to uh, teachers and trainers. If we think that schools and B2B service providers have achieved this kind of monumental and industry-wide shift, uh, literally, quite literally, overnight in some cases, um, as we are starting to move to what can only be described as a new normal. What advice would you be giving to trainers, Richard, working their way through week 10 of um, this new way of working? And I'll ask the same of you, Robin and Nora, as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of times about the, the, the sheer overnightness, if you like, of, of, of the, the COVID um, issue. And what, what it's done is actually just accelerated a lot of trainers um, in, in terms of you know the way they teach and, and the technical skills that they need, uh, I've been quite surprised with with some of my team who are now just totally okay using online platforms. And you know, two months ago, they could barely switch on a computer seriously. Um, so I think one key message for for trainers is you have to be flexible. Um, the the world is shifting, and also you know alluding to something Matt kind of touched on, you know, there, there might be some kind of hybrid model for students, um, some online, some face-to-face, -face, et cetera. And I think in, in business as well, there's going to be a lot more flexibility. Um, so we, we'll see hybrid courses rather than traditional in, in the classroom. Um, and again, this can be a really, really good thing. You know, we can, we can follow up with people that go off to Russia. We can follow up with people that go off to China. So I think basically the, the, the message I give to my staff is please op open up your mind and uh, make sure that you acquire new skills. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to be left behind. Yeah, that, that's frankly the reality, isn't it? Has, have you got anything you want to add there, Robin? Um, not, not too much, but I think just to say that um, whether it's online uh, or face to face, it's still teaching. So you're, you're still it's the same things that you want really to do. Um, and uh, and um, also, I think just um, there are kind of uh, there's been lots of discussion about whether uh, teaching should be live, should be live video lessons, or whether it should be you know uh, done at students' own time. But like all these kind of discussions, the the the, the best is a mix of both. Uh, and uh, very recently, we ran some teacher training for teachers within the British Council, and the most successful model is to have um, is to have self access tasks. Um, before the, the before you have a seminar with with teachers, um, so that, uh, that 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 they're coming prepared for to discuss um, 
uh, to discuss the learning when you have them live. And that, to be honest, is I think what you alluded to much earlier in the call about the, the difference between um, uh, the students who are thriving uh, in the online space. It's if you go into the lesson prepared and, and, and knowing what it's going to be about, that allows different personality types who maybe often struggled in schools to, to thrive in an online environment. Yeah, and I think that's particularly the case when working in a second language as well. It gives yeah. that you get more of a, 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 f a firmer footing uh, in in a learning situation. Um, I, I, that, from from my perspective, I, I was reflecting on this earlier. What kind of advice I would give to teachers? Because for the last, uh, well, for the last few weeks, I've been empathetic, totally empathetic with all the teachers who are in this situation. And you can't you can't underestimate the. Um, amount of work that it takes to to be teaching online and the preparation and there's no doubt Richard you're absolutely right and Robin it takes far more preparation to teach online than just face to face but I think um, if I was going to give any advice it would be threefold really one is to if there's any opportunity to find a way to evaluate what's gone well and what can you harness from what you've been doing that's working well when you returned when we return to the classroom uh, because this hybrid model will, un will undoubtedly um, ensue uh, I think it's also um, worth noting for teachers and, and trainers, particularly teachers, that parents are undoubtedly enormously appreciative of the commitment that teachers have shown and the efforts that they've made to get good online get, get good at online learning quickly, and to ensure learning and progress have continued. Um, the attention to detail in selecting appropriate activities and as you mentioned Nora that key feedback I think teachers need to feel that there is an acknowledgement of that and so that would be a feedback for me but I think even more pertinently and dare I say it I think teachers need to be ready for another lockdown I think we would be remiss to think that as we head into the summer and things look rosy that as we head into the autumn and winter of this year Things may return to as they are right now. So, in terms of advice in that, those terms, and we've got a question here from Emily, which might be pertinent here, and this might relate to how we how our practice. Um, with the increased dependence on technology, it is more difficult for friendships to develop organically. Cliques are more defined, and students can end up being more isolated and even experience more acute cyberbullying. What are some ways that we could think about tackling these issues? Have you have you experienced any? Have you had an awareness? of that well I mean undoubtedly it's happening Nora? yeah I mean we've we've been um, we've been very careful to look out for things like um, you know noticing students not handing in work or noticing students not being present in lessons um, you know it is more difficult without doubt to safeguard and to care for children in a social and emotional way online and that's definitely uh, that's a major setback of the situation that we find ourselves in so we've really tried to create uh, lots of social environments. For example, you know, obviously the, the school day is made up of various lessons and then there's, you know, tutor time or homeroom or whatever. So we've, we've kept that homeroom, not necessarily every day. There's been a certain amount of flexibility for teachers, but we've kept that homeroom time each week. So for example, my, my students and I, uh, we always meet on the Tuesday and a Friday and then depending on the week, we'll meet on Wednesday as well. And basically that's an opportunity just for games, chit chat, um, we do you know cahoots silly things so just to give us an opportunity to have a look at children you know their, their their mics are on their videos are on and just then because we have a system at bst where there are two tutors in each in each homeroom one of us can use that opportunity just to go into a breakout room individually with each child um you know at least once a week um just to try and touch base because I think um, we're, we're definitely aware that some students have really um, suffered, you know, the, the, the increase of time online has exacerbated those kinds of issues. And so we're very much watching out for it. Um, and it's actually and something that's not necessarily new. Um, yeah. It's something that schools spend a lot of time training staff on and being aware of. Uh, it's not to say that it's easy to spot or easy to handle. Um, but it is definitely something that is a... I think one of the key thing there is just keeping that channel of communication with parents open. Um, that parents, you know, uh, we spend a lot of time calling parents, you know, if we're concerned about this or that, just keeping in touch. And parents need to feel that if there's a problem, they wouldn't um, hesitate any more than under normal circumstances to pick up the phone to the child's tutor. We really rely on on parents. Um, so I'd say to Emily, you know, uh, you know, if if you sense that you know you're aware of that happening within your community, you know, I urge parents to get in touch with school is really important. 
I think that's very wise advice, uh, getting to school quickly. And there's another question here from uh, Shoko Suge, um, who sent several questions. I'll pick the one in the middle there that says, um, in relation to online parental controls, how would we give students or the parents discipline, like in the real classroom? How do we manage, um, the question is, pointing to how do we manage behavior in an online situation and and how do we make sure students concentrate in class and i think that's probably goes right the way across classroom and training room that's tough i mean i tend to set short time limited tasks um you know so i, I would say one thing that, that i i think is really important is that in an online classroom you know best practice which is you know sort of cold call don't let students decide when they're going to let you know because they feel comfortable doing so you know in your class make sure that you are picking students strategically for reasons because uh, or, you know and randomly just ensuring that the teachers in control of at any time picking on a student and students need to know that your expectation is that at any time you're able to respond there's something called um, no opt-out which you know we use at the british school and and i use myself you know students are not able to say sorry i wasn't listening you know that they are gonna have to give an answer and if they're not able to give a full answer We'll bring in another student and then they, they, they will rephrase and, and repackage what they've heard to show that I'm not going to stop talking to you until I have, I'm confident that you understand this important concept. Um, so I think that's important. Um, and also I mean, just for older students, you know, we're still doing assessments, timed assessments, and they need to be submitted in you know, 45 minutes or in one hour. I'll post the question and then the essays come back. So I think high expectations is important. You know, yeah. students leave my classroom, for example, and they've not done the main task, then, um, you know, I'll let their tutor know, I'll let the student know, and after a day or two, I'll let their parents know. And those, so... Those think, systems need to stay in place, exactly. Yeah, yeah it, those it, systems it's need difficult. to stay in place. It does take more work, though, I think, because, you know, you can't just go over and say, look, <laughs> you know, you're not producing any work, get cracking. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, bit, it's a bit tougher, but I think we just have to take that on the chin and, and accept that there's going to be a little bit more investment required from teachers at the moment. I think it's one of those, it's unfortunate that we are unable to use that uh, one teacher eyebrow that we all have uh, across the room. Uh, it's very difficult to do that through Zoom. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, undoubtedly, a heavy burden has fallen onto parents attempting to supervise online learning at home. And what I, advice can we offer to those struggling to, well, first of all, maintain sanity, frankly, uh, but also maintain their children's motivation and engagement in learning. Um, anybody want to venture some advice? I think I said be curious earlier, and that's, I think that's really important to, to be interested in uh, what, what your children are working on to find out how the, how the Zoom call has gone um, I think with with so many projects now being done at home, there's also the chance to to be much more hands on in the 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 building of ancient Egypt or or whatever 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 other project is um, is at hand. So that's I think that's really important, and we've we've known through research for many many years the the central role of parental involvement. I think the other two the other two quick things from me. I would say be open-minded. Um, I think what we've seen so far is people accelerating change that they had at least half imagined. Um, and we, we at the British Council moved our English language lessons online at great speed. And it was um, something that required huge effort and um, it's been it's been inspiring to see the, the teachers make that transition. But we also have to admit it was something that we had been talking about for a long time. And, and I think there's a sense in which the, the crisis has accelerated change. I think what happens next is potentially more, more of a revolution. Um, we had a question about augmented reality and virtual reality. We're also reading about how um, AI algorithms might help to tailor an individual learning experience or to play a role in assessment even. So to, I would say to parents to be open-minded about what the future models of education might look like and not, not be completely wedded to the, the idea that what we grew up with ourselves is going to be the best option in the future. And finally, I would say to be 
to, to be actively supporting the school, um, to be actively supporting the teacher with, with, with constructive feedback, not to be weighing in with those brilliantly uh, crafted and demolishing emails that, that, that so cleverly point the finger at the, the, the challenges, but to be uh, offering, offering helpful solutions and trying to improve uh, the institution in the process. I, I would just come in, Kirsten, and say, I think, you know, for parents, um, I absolutely agree with, with um, Matt, and I've, you know, I've got young children myself, but for those parents of older children, where perhaps they honestly feel like it's harder to get involved in, you know, explaining the second law of thermodynamics or, or, you know, a soliloquy in Macbeth, I think that, um, that number one, there's a lot that you can do without actually engaging in, in what they're doing academically, making sure that they're getting up making sure that they've got a routine, um, you know, that they've got their equipment in place. These sorts of things are really, really important. And one benefit I've noticed from this is that no children are forgetting books. No children don't have their, you know, their, their, their copy of the text or whatever. So, you know, having the, the rudiments around you and being up on time, breakfasted and dressed reasonably is a really important foundation. And secondly, you know, um, a really important, um, a really important spur, something that catalyzes learning for all children is explaining it to somebody else. So if you feel like you don't understand mathematics at that level, ask them to explain it to you. Don't be shy. And it's fine if you don't understand anything about the context. In fact, it's even better because if they can explain what they're doing to you, rephrase and, and regenerate, you know, these generative tasks you talk about, then that's incredibly valuable. So don't be shy of your own lack of um, you know, um, dome specific knowledge. Um, just open up those discussions if you can. I think those are very wise words coming from a teacher and also a parent there. And I, I think that's really wise. I think it, over the last few months, it must have been incredibly difficult for parents to assume the role of teacher in your own home with your own children. The curriculum has changed since we were at school parents are not used to the routines and the sort of systems of classrooms it's hard to know where you should be challenging your child to be how do you know where the milestones are all of those things are really difficult for parents and I think we should acknowledge the anxiety that that has engendered uh, in so many of the parents around the world this isn't unique to Tokyo it's absolutely global um, if I was going to offer any advice of course I echo uh, absolutely echo your um, your um, support um, Nora I think the other side of this is the way that we support students emotionally and we mustn't underestimate the um, situation and the experience that students have had when we have enormous crises like these sort of global large-scale crises children mm. the ch children's trust in adults ability to solve a problem is shaken uh, and we experienced this during the earthquake in uh, 2011, that they suddenly realized, ah, gosh, my parent or my significant adult, my teacher, isn't actually in control of everything. And it shakes that really deep belief that you will solve anything. And so as parents, we must make sure that we are reassuring children um, and, and adults that we're reassuring that we're doing everything we can to show them that we are doing everything possible to keep them safe and of course that all needs to be age appropriate so that would be my first uh, bit of advice and my second bit would be to be um reassure them that schools are doing everything they can that when they go back to school all the protocols will be in place to make sure it's as safe as possible um, and acknowledge how they're feeling and acknowledge how you're feeling in age appropriate terms with them um, and the, just the final bit of advice I would have for parents is and this is something I've heard a lot over the last few weeks particularly for younger children I think when you're working with secondary children there's a greater degree of independence but for younger children most children between the age of five and 11 do not work independently, even in the classroom. They have their support network and that's why we have teachers in the room. And so please do be aware that your child will not necessarily be able to pick up their task and just do it. And this is where you're right, Nora, the burden falls, the burden falls heavily on parents at the moment. I'm sure there were lots of cheers last night as the um, state of emergency was lifted and we'll see some changes, hopefully, at least in the next few weeks, if not immediately after the summer. 
Well, it's one o'clock, everybody, and I want to um, draw us to a close here to make sure we finish on time. It has been an absolute delight to talk with uh, our panellists today. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to Nora, to Matt, to Robin and to Richard. I probably could sit here all afternoon and chat with you, but we, we won't. We'll get back to, uh, to other Zoom meetings and other online learning. Um, I hope that uh, the community have enjoyed the conversation today and that you've got taken something from it and that in the not too distant future we can get together and be face to face to uh, perhaps share these educational conversations over a glass of wine which I know that we are all um, uh, all, all have a preference for doing that so to close off with today thank you Nora Robin Richard thank you for the opportunity thank you it's been really thank fun you thank much. you it's been Excellent. lovely it's been lovely to speak to you and I will just close off by saying stay safe and stay connected everyone bye